Well, on Wednesday nights, we have been walking through a series where we are taking scripture in a biblical worldview and we're applying it to the life in which we live. And I'm planning to do this for a few more weeks and then we're going to shift gears into something else. But Sundays are designed to expositionally go through God's word. Wednesdays give us a little room to cover some things that we may not normally on Sunday have as much time to delve into or to see the implications of God's word in the world in which we live. So we've looked at a lot of different issues that are very important. Tonight, what I plan to do is finish a very important concern that we've been looking at over the last few weeks and then launch into another, uh, probably a final, very, very important concern in our culture. So we're going to continue and conclude talking about racism tonight. We're going to continue uh, and we're going to finish walking through the statement on social justice and the gospel. So if by chance you have that from the last couple of weeks and you've tucked it in your Bible, we're on the fifth page. And if you don't, then um, I think we have a few copies available somewhere. I don't know where they are, but uh, you would do just as well to listen. Or you could just Google the statement on social justice and the gospel. And if I find out you're looking at something else, I'll just shoot you. Uh, or something very nonviolent like that. What, Diala? Um, are, are there some in the back, Joel? Will you look? If you, um, if you would like one, just throw your hand up. And if we have one, we'll get it to you. And if we don't, we can't create it out of thin air, but we can print some more sometime. All right. Well, uh, we're just reading through the statement, so let's do it uh, because I want to enter into some different waters tonight. The passage or the summary, the statement on page five covers race and ethnicity. It's section 12. And it says this, we affirm God made all people from one man Though people often can be distinguished by different ethnicities and nationalities, they are ontological equals, which means in their being, they have equal dignity before God. In both creation and redemption, race is not a biblical category, but rather a social construct that often has been used to classify groups of people in terms of inferiority and superiority. So it's the prejudicial treatment of another person based on the color of their skin, treating them better or worse. All that is good, honest, just, and beautiful in various ethnic backgrounds and experiences can be celebrated as the fruit of God's grace. God's created with wonderful variety that displaces glory and diversity. All sinful actions and the results, including evils perpetrated between and upon Ethnic groups by others are to be confessed as sinful, repented of, and repudiated. So we need to search our hearts anywhere in our own hearts where we have racism as defined by a prejudicial treatment of someone else based on the color of their skin. Uh, treating them as less than an image bearer of God, as less than deserving of the full dignity of the Imago Dei. That should be repented as sinful. It should be acknowledged as sinful. It should be turned from and we should flee to Christ for forgiveness that's freely offered in him. In setting up our country and writing the Declaration of Independence, our founding fathers clearly acknowledged equality as men and women, boys and girls made in the image of God and under or in the sacred rights of our creator, black, white, regardless of ethnicity or gender or any other classification. But it was very clear from the beginning, at some point, slavery was going to have to be addressed and dealt with. And by way of summary, we see slavery throughout the scriptures, but it's regulated by God to be a blessing to master and to slave But chattel slavery or the diminishing of human life in what is often thought of as slavery uh, certainly is problematic and sinful. And so from the beginning in this country, drawing on scripture, we saw men and women made equally 
in the image of God with an opportunity to flourish. What we see now is called a demand for economic and social equality, which means basically everyone should have the same outcome, not just the same opportunity. And this is a road towards socialism and communism. This is not what the scriptures teach. It means that we're be, to be treated with equal dignity. Uh, and listen, you have the right to pursue happiness. There's no guarantee that you will arrive at it. <laughs> but you have the right to pursue it. There's no guarantee that you're going to have an equal opportunity. Some of us are born in families with more money, less money, more opportunity, less opportunity. But this is a right that we're made in the image of God, deserving uh, to be treated as his image bearers. We are, we are not, however, deserving to be entitled to whatever we want in life. We're not entitled to whatever our neighbor has. Uh, that's coveting. And so there's a distinction in this liberty. We deny, the statement says, that Christians should segregate themselves into racial groups or regard racial identity above or even equal to their identity in Christ. And we see an issue even in Acts 6 with a potential split in the church between the Greek speaking and the Hebrews. And so we want to guard against this. We deny that any divisions between people groups from an unstated attitude of superiority to an overt spirit of resentment have any legitimate place in the fellowship of the redeemed. We reject any teaching that encourages racial groups to view themselves as privileged oppressors or entitled victims of oppression. While we are to weep with those who weep, we deny that a person's feelings of offense or oppression necessarily prove that someone is guilty of sinful behaviors, oppression, or prejudice. So we don't ultimately identify any people group as those who are oppressed and entitled and deserving. And just because someone says or feels that they've been oppressed does not mean that they have been oppressed. Um, maybe they have. Maybe they haven't. There's clarification that needs to happen there. The next section deals with culture and basically, in summary, talks about how sin is found in every culture in some shape, form, or fashion. And in most every culture, we see blessings of God's grace and His giftedness. But today, America, by many, has been labeled as a culture that is irredeemably racist. And we saw this beginning with Malcolm X, and we've seen this with a variety of groups. And it's basically a, a plot to overthrow our country. And there's no forgiveness, there's no liberation in this sort of ideology. Um, but we do see um, we do see sin in cultures. We see sin lay systematically in the laws of some cultures. But today the discussion is over systemic racism, systemic racism. But to make a claim of systemic racism, you have to validate that claim. Show me where in the law, show me systematically where in our culture, point to it, show me where this is occurring so that we can address it. You can't just throw out America is full of systemic racism and then we just say, okay, because you said that. We need to address that issue. We need to point to where do we find that? Does that make sense? And so that is a term that's thrown around quite a bit. And where it is found, it needs to be repented of. It needs to be addressed and changed. Well, finally, let's look at the last category. And um, it's entitled just simply... Racism. Racism. We affirm that racism is a sin rooted in pride and malice, which must be condemned and renounced by all who would honor the image of God in all people. And that needs to be stressed. Such racial sin can subtly or overtly manifest itself as racial, racial animosity or racial vainglory. Such race, uh, sinful prejudice or partiality falls short of God's revealed will and violates the royal, royal law of love. We affirm that virtually all cultures, including our own, 
at times contain laws and systems that foster racist attitudes and policies. And we want nothing to do with this as a church. Growing up in the culture that we have grown up in, it is thick with the propensity to have the sin of racism. And we want to search our hearts. We want to search our souls for that. We want to repent everywhere we need to. But dealing with racism is an issue that has to be dealt with through the gospel. And that's the only way that we'll find reconciliation. The way that we're seeing it dealt with today is uh, very antithetical to the gospel. One of the ways that we see it being dealt with today is we're toppling statues. We're trying to overturn institutions. Any statue of any of our founding fathers who in any way smelled like or participated in any way in slavery, it's almost like we want to do a wholesale destruction of all of that. Listen, what we need to do is understand our story the way it happened. And we need to uh, understand where racism has occurred and we need to acknowledge it as wicked. But listen, we don't need to be grinding down every statue in our country. We won't have a country left if we eliminate every statue associated with sin. Let's, let's do that. Let's eliminate every statue and every institution that has anything to do with racism or any other significant sin not only will we not have a country, we won't have a church and we won't have anybody, including you and me. This is not the answer to racism. This is the answer of absurdity. So the statement says we deny that treating people with sinful partiality or prejudice is consistent with biblical Christianity. We deny also that only those in positions of power are capable of racism. Racism can work toward any people, toward any place, not just those who have power. Or that individuals of any particular ethnic groups are incapable of racism. So critical race theory today would say that um, any group that's in the majority would, by definition, be incapable of racism. The only way that you can make that claim is to redefine what you mean by racism. So it's possible anywhere. We deny that systemic racism is in any way compatible with the core principles of historic evangelical convictions. We deny that the Bible can be legitimately used to foster or justify partiality, prejudice, or contempt toward other ethnicities. We deny that the contemporary evangelical movement has any deliberate agenda to elevate one ethnic group and subjugate another. And we emphatically deny that lectures on social justice or activism aimed at reshaping the wider culture are as vital to the life and health of the church as the preaching of the gospel and the exposition of scripture. That's central. Historically, such things tend to become distractions that inevitably lead to departures from the gospel. In summary, over this concern, I simply want to say this. You and I both know that this is a hot button issue in our country. And it has been for a long time and it continues to climax. But there is a war over our country right now. And one of the issues alongside the issue that we've talked about social uh, of sexuality is the issue of critical race theory, social justice, intersectionality, cultural Marxism, and all of the things that I've spent the last month trying to unpack. This is such a massive ordeal that our former president had to address this because training was being implemented in our federal system among federal employees to buy into all of the anti-biblical garbage that I have just spent taking us through over the last few weeks. This is at the heart and core of the Black Lives Matter movement. This, is a, this isn't a, a movement with an agenda to destroy our country. And it has not and it will not heal race relations. It will make them intensely worse. 
The answer to the racial problems in our country, no doubt, can be complex. But the answer, I'm telling you with certainty, is not critical race theory. It is not social justice and is not any of the garbage that we've been walking through. The answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reconciliation that we find in Christ together. Local churches being salt and light, healing bridges, uh, healing uh, gaps between peoples that should not be divided. That's the answer to this. And it's not all of these other false ideologies. So I've spent a few weeks going through this. It needs to be on our radar. And we need to cling to the sufficiency of Scripture. We don't need this stuff. We don't need this stuff. The Scriptures give us the answer for this. Well, I want to encourage you to turn your Bible to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. I really didn't want to take a whole night to go through that, but we will review it in the, in the discussion time if you have any questions. I want to begin to move from one very, very sensitive, difficult issue into another. And the ulterior motive I have in all of this is really just to help us see how Scripture is all for life. Scripture speaks to all of the major issues that we face in life. And the problems that we have are rejection of God and His holy word. How you view God, your theology, drives everything else about you. How you view Him, how you view life, how you view your purpose in life, how you identify yourself. And I want us to move now to the very, very important concern in our culture, particularly today, which is the concern of life. Look with me in Psalm 139, verse 13. Verse 13, and this will just be a bit of an introduction to what we'll begin to wrestle through in the coming weeks. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. The point here from the psalmist is that man is personally created in the image of God in the womb of a woman. I want you to look in Psalm 139. The overall point in this section is that God sees everything and God knows everything because God is everywhere and because God made everything and he controls everything. No place, even the hidden place that we're going to look at tonight is off limits and impenetrable to his presence. So in Psalm 139, the psalmist is taking heart in the God who created his life and all life, who knows him and preserves him. And even now, nothing is outside of his watchful care. God formed him from the very beginning. Look with me in verses 7 through 12. The second stanza concludes in verses 11 through 12 with a reference to the dark place. Even darkness is light to God. There's nowhere, including the darkest places, where you can flee from the all-seeing eye of God and His all-invading presence. And as we come to verse 13, we see that even in the darkness of the womb. God is still not out of touch. And so the psalmist is moving to this uniquely and vulnerably dark place, which is not unseen by God. It is actually the workshop of a sovereign and holy and good God. I want you to notice as we look at this, the repetition of the word you, the divine involvement, the personal nature of what's happened. It's intensely intimate language of me and I and you. Look with me in your Bible in verse 13. He uses the word formed. It means to be woven together. 
The idea pervading this psalm is that you can't escape God in the heights of heaven, in the depths of the grave, in the ends of the earth, in the cover of darkness, and not even the darkness of the womb. The human womb testifies more than ever today with our technology to the glory of the omnipotence, the all-powerful nature of God. Look in your Bible in verse 13. He says the inward parts are woven by the master craftsman. It refers to the kidneys. It's a symbol of all of one's vital organs in the scriptures, including your inmost emotions, your thoughts, your moral sensitivities. It screams the wonder and creation of God. Now, I'm pretty confident that there's not need tonight for the discussion of how babies are made and born. But think about the process of conception and the development of a child in the womb of a mother. Is it not absolutely mind-blowing? Picture the master craftsman sewing not only every artery and vein, constructing the human heart and every nerve ending and every fingernail, every cell in that body, when even in the darkest place, unseen to the human eye. One pastor in the 1800s said, the very thought of his creation stirs his soul and awakens praise. Neither man nor angel could devise anything at once so nice and so strong, so curious and so useful. So in penning these words, you can see David in just utter astonishment describing what's happening in the womb. What this means and what we need to impress on the generations now and to come is that you are not an accident, friend. Your life is not an accident. Your circumstances are not an accident. The situation surrounding your birth, no matter how devastatingly painful it could be, is not an accident. You were crafted with the master hands of a divine creator down to the cellular level from eternity past. Conceived in his heart, crafted in the womb. That gives me chills. God does not create junk and he does not create without intent. Quite literally, what we teach our children, he has the whole world in his hands. In every cell of our body, in every circumstance of our life, it always was, even before you were seen or could realize it, and it will always be in his hands. Contrary to the wicked who are created for destruction, those who are not only created once by God, but believers are created anew in Christ Jesus. The Bible says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has already decreed and prepared before we were even born, that we were walking in it. Even before his mother knew that she was pregnant, the Lord was the one forming those inward parts and knitting him together, her together, in that womb. Let's stop for just a minute tonight. And let's think, let's think about this. Do you want evidence for the presence of God in the world in your life tonight? You don't need to look any farther than your fingertips. You don't need to think any farther back than your own birth. It's only as a result of the master craftsman. Apart from the personal work of God, think about it. I have heard doctors say, doctors who have told me, that the more they went through medical school and studied the human brain or the complexities of human life, there is no way 
without the personal handiwork of God that such intricate complexities, spiritual and mental development. I mean, think about the argument from consciousness. How does someone become conscious of their existence? This is why Descartes, the old philosopher, said something that sounds ridiculous, but is actually fairly brilliant. (laughs) He said that he could doubt everything in his life. But the one thing that he couldn't doubt, he summed up with the famous words, I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am. I'm conscious of my own existence. I must exist in some way. How did I become conscious of my own existence? Is it because I'm so smart? Do you reach an intelligence level to all of a sudden you don't remain as a computer, you just become a conscious human being? No. God creates consciousness within us, physical and mental development, spiritual being. And so what this brings us back to is what we've seen over and over on Wednesday nights, the Imago Day. Every child from conception to natural death created in the image of God, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of gender, regardless of ability or disability, regardless of the capability that someone has, they are created in the image of God, worthy of his dignity. Job said in chapter 10, verse 11, you clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. The safest place on the planet, the womb of a mother in our culture today has now become the most dangerous place that human life could ever venture. And I'm here to tell you, I believe that a government that can't be trusted to protect life inside the womb cannot be trusted to rightly govern life outside the womb. A government that cannot be trusted to protect life inside the womb cannot be trusted to rightly govern life outside the womb. The more highly we study biology, the more it turns us to theology, understanding who we are, as image bearers of God. We're going to continue to talk about this. But I want us to encourage, I want to encourage us as we think about this, as we have a discussion about this, as we prepare to relate to people in our homes, in our church, and especially in the world, that we need to think in light of the whole counsel of God. We live not in a culture of life. We live in a culture of death. Listen, they can say all day long that they love life. Uh, That's why they've locked us in our homes for a year. That's why they're giving us vaccines. That's why they're closing our churches down. That's why they don't want us getting the flu. Listen, they can say all day long they preserve life. I don't hear it as long as they slaughter babies in the womb. I don't hear it. I don't believe it. But I want us to understand that this is a very sensitive issue. For a mother to lose a child in the womb is a very painful experience. And that's because there's an instinct within us that understands that that it is not an it. That's a child. And so it should cause us to look to Christ. It should cause us to care for one another. It should cause us to love one another well, to be sensitive to these issues, to value human life, and it should cause us to mourn the loss of human life. And I want to encourage us to lament that, to mourn through that, to try to understand one another and come alongside one another and all who have gone through such a painful experience of losing life. I also believe that we're living in a day where we have cultural elites that are claiming that they want to defeat racism. Don't tell me that you want to defeat racism. When you set up abortion clinics in the middle 
of black communities. Don't tell me that you want to protect black lives when you are setting them up to be murdered in the womb before they're even born. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Black lives matter. All black lives matter. And that includes black lives in the womb. And as prophetic as the church, I believe, has a prophetic voice to the government and to the cultural elites to understand that abortion is not pro-choice, it is pro-murder. I more so want to speak tonight to us and the people that we will have relationships with. Most likely, we're not going to probably be having too many relationships with senators or representatives or presidents or cultural elites in the next week. Matter of fact, long as I don't step on their agenda too hard, they could care less what I have to say. But what we will be having, who we will be having conversations with is people who are caught in the crosshairs of satanic warfare. What we will be in relationship with is people who have, who have bought the lie that's being shoved down their throat. What we will come into contact with is young ladies who were put in a very difficult situation and they're scared to death and they don't know where to turn and they know that this is going to change their life and there's pressure from someone around them to do the only thing that they know to do. Maybe a friend, maybe a family member, maybe a previous lover. And when that's all you're sold all the time, What's in the womb is disposable to get you out of a bad situation. It's no wonder. So as we begin to walk into this, I want to make a couple things very clear. Life in the womb is just that. It's life. And taking it is the destruction of life and murder. But there is freedom and forgiveness in Christ. I would not be surprised if there are, I don't know about it, but I'm just telling you based on the research that I've done and the statistics that I know and the experience that I've had in the church, I would not be surprised if there are quite a few ladies, maybe in our church, who've experienced this and have never told anyone. And I want you to know if that's you, you don't have to tell anyone, although that could be helpful in a trusted environment for your healing. There's forgiveness in Christ. And I want that to be our posture toward our culture. There is forgiveness and cleansing and freedom in Christ. You don't have to hang your head in shame. You can take your guilty hands where we all take our guilty hands to the blood of Christ and the fountain of eternal life and be washed in his blood. And I want us to talk about in this series some practical ways specifically that we as a church can be involved in this realm proactively in a gospel-centered way that's in alignment with our mission. So I just leave that as an introduction and we'll continue to have discussion about it over the next few weeks. Father, we thank you that your word informs how we think about and how we live life. We thank you for the forgiveness and the mercy that we have in Christ for all of our sin. And we pray that you would help us to be equipped with the truth to think about all of these complicated issues on the horizon. Oh, Lord, help us not to buy the wicked ideologies that we are being told to drink like water today. Lord, help us to think biblically according to your word and help us to be salt and light in this world and to see, to see your lordship de de uh, dem demonstrated in every dimension of life. Father, we pray that you would help us to have fruitful discussion and thoughts, thinking about how the light can penetrate the darkness in every single one of these issues. Use us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.